All of us have to face temptations of some sort. And probably until the last day of our life, we'll be dealing with something. Doesn't mean that you deal the same thing all the time. But temptation is just a part of life. Look at this awesome, corrupt, evil, vile society in which we live. But Adam and Eve had to deal with that, and there was none of this. And every generation has had to deal with it, so we can't blame it on somebody else and something else. Because we have a fallen nature, and because we live in a fallen world, temptation is something we have to deal with probably most every day. Not every day necessarily. And it doesn't mean that you deal with the same temptations all the time, or maybe as many as you did before you were at this point in life. But it's there. And the issue is this, how do you deal with it? A lot of people will live their whole life and never decide how to deal with temptation. It just happens that when it hits them for some reason, this is the way they respond. And if this hits me here, I'll respond this way. So they don't have any real method of responding. Is there a way to deal with temptation? In other words, can I build some kind of defense? Can I look ahead and respond and know that, uh, this, that this will always work? Probably most people would say no because we're all different. If that's true, then that means we are all subject to the satanic power the power of the devil to hit us from every side, every angle, anytime, anywhere, and down we go. That is not the will of God, the purpose of God, or the plan of God. So you say, well, can we live without temptation? No. But we don't have to yield to it unless we choose to. You say, but you know what? You just don't know how tempted I am. And you don't know that the the kind of temptation I deal with. So let me say two things. Number one, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're on your own. You, you don't have any real defense because you're dealing with someone who's got the answers and knows exactly when to hit you, where to hit you, and how long to hit you to bring you down. So if you're not a believer, you don't have a chance. You don't have a choice. If you are, you have the opportunity to understand what temptation's like, what it's about, what it really is, what is the goal of it, who's behind it, and that you can live not without temptation, but without continuous falling. You say, well, will you ever reach a stage in your life where you're not tempted anymore? I doubt it. Will, will uh, you ever live to a place in life where some things don't bother you anymore. I think that's true. But as far as temptation, absolutely out of your life, no. It may be something as simple as you just gossip. You gossiped at 20. You gossiped at 40, 60, 80. You're still doing it. And you're still asking God to forgive you. Or it may be something far more serious than that. And many people do. They live with sin in their life. They live facing the same temptation over and over again, and this is their conclusion. Well, I guess that's just the way it is. That's the way it is that everybody's tempted by something, and so this happens to be mine, and so I guess I'll just have to live and die with it. You don't have to. You may live and die with the temptation, but not falling to it, not succumbing to it, not being defeated by it. But that's a matter of your attitude and your understanding and the possibility of building a defense in your life to protect you. Well, the best place to go that I know to find out how to deal with temptation is with the one who conquered it every single time, and that's Jesus. Let me use the analogy of becoming physically fit or physically transformed into fitness to illustrate how we may become spiritually or mentally transformed in fitness. Almost everybody would see the common sense in saying that if you want to be physically fit, there would be two aspects to the process of transformation. Let's call them resistance and reception. By resistance, I mean the kinds of exercises that uh, put your muscle under great deal of unnatural strain, right? For example, you, you want your biceps 
to be stronger so you can lift heavier packages or lift light ones more easily. You you curl a, a weight up and down, say 10, 15, 20 pounds, and you do it enough times that the last one you can barely do it. it the resistance is so strong against your your bicep. And in that process of resistance, the bicep, ironically, become stronger. It's strange that you make yourself look like an idiot, trembling and pulling and unable to pull it up for the 10th or 20th time. And out of that weakness, a few weeks later, lo and behold, it, your bicep is stronger. And what I mean by reception, so that was resistance. What I mean by reception is that you, you take into your body, you receive healthy foods and sufficient sleep the kind of activity that is not so much pushing against something, but rather welcoming right and good things into your body. So there's the analogy, and uh, you can work with it and see if I've got it right physically, because I don't know much about that, but it seems to work for me. And now let's apply it to the spiritual, mental fitness of the way uh, the Bible says it happens. And of course, these... uh, resistance and reception are not sequential. They're not sequential, like some days you do resistance and some days you eat. No, it's it's simultaneous at the same time, in the same days. Um, first, there's the biblical principle of resistance. So James says in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And Paul says in Romans 8, 13, put to death, kill the deeds of the body by the Spirit. So we we kill specific sins by targeting them with lethal resistance. James chapter 1, verse 3. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So the testing of faith corresponds to the lifting of the barbell by your bicep. Some temptation or some suffering comes into your life and threatens to conquer you and ruin your faith and your holiness, and and you have to lay hold on a promise of God and push hard against the rising doubt and unbelief with all your might as you rely upon the promise of God, and so push back the encroaching darkness just like you you push on the floor when you do push-ups. Why? Because this produces steadfastness or endurance. This means that those tests, those, those pressures of unbelief and, and uh, temptation, those tests that have to be resisted by faith result in two things. They enable us to resist greater tests, greater temptations, greater suffering in the future, and they enable us to meet the, the old test that used to make us stumble with relative ease so that we're not thrown into crisis every time we meet some sexual temptation, say. Now, all of this applies to lust and and sexual temptation because those are thoughts and tests that we have to resist. We have to take hold of a promise of Christ, believe it, and then use it to push, actively push the thought out of our minds. We say, no, no, no. I mean, I I do this. I'm I'm not kidding here. I mean, a thought, some lustful thought or some image comes into your mind, and you've got about five seconds to decide whether you're going to let it take over or whether you're going to push on it with, no, you're out of here. In Jesus' name, you're out of here, directing your attention to some superior promise. Jesus is better. Jesus is enough. He said this. You're out of here, and you keep pushing until it's gone. So that's what I mean by resistance, the resistance half of transformation. And I I want to encourage you that even though it may feel or sound exhausting at first, it really does yield a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Read read Hebrews 12 and and you'll see what I mean. Now here's the second half. That's only the first half. And if and so many Christians Um, try to solve the problems of their temptations and their defeats only by the resistance half of of sanctification. It won't work. It just won't work in the long run. So let me give 
what I mean by the, the reception part. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Notice, this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. We are receivers. We are receivers. This is the reception side. We are fixing our gaze on the glory of the Lord, and we do that mainly in the Word. We linger over the sweet and beautiful descriptions of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We marinate our minds receptively by faith in the crock pot of God's Word. And we fix our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, on Jesus. And the more we receive and receive into our hearts the beauty of Christ through the eyes of the heart, as we read and meditate, the more we will have his desires, his preferences, his convictions. We will be receptively transformed. Oh, how sweet to have that uh, receptive transformation so that the the hooks of the devil don't even lodge themselves anymore. Here's another here's another passage to stir in. Colossians 3:10 that reminds us that in Jesus we are new creatures. We have new selves, but we must put on the new self. That is receive the new self. Put it on like a a coat. Consciously receive it. But there's a phrase in Colossians 3.10 that tips us off how it happens. It says, put on the new self, and here it comes, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So the transformation of the mind and the desires and the thoughts of the new self happens in knowledge. This is just like saying, look to Jesus more and more and your thoughts and your feelings will be changed. You will experience your newness. Here's the last passage I'll mention that relates to to newness through beholding Christ, newness through knowledge. And it relates specifically to sexual temptation. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 5. Here's what Paul says. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. And here comes the key. Not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So notice where Paul lays the fault of sexual passion taking control and ruining our lives. He says that passion, that sinful passion, rules in people who do not know, just like Colossians 3.10. Don't know, just like 2 Corinthians 3.18. Don't see, don't meditate on, don't know, don't absorb, don't receive the knowledge of God. In other words, they, they haven't been renewed in knowledge. They haven't set their minds to behold the glory of Jesus day and night so that they become like what they admire. And so they are at the mercy of their sinful passions because they haven't been transformed by putting on the new self renewed in knowledge. So that's the biblical pattern of transforming our minds and our hearts so that we are less vulnerable to sexual temptation. It's both resistance against unbelief and temptation and doubt and Satan, and it is the sweet, enjoyable reception through God's Word of the preciousness and the beauty and the greatness of Jesus, both resistance and reception over time transforms our hearts and our minds.